All right, so feel free to uh, interrupt me um, if you have any questions. Uh, so thank you very much for the nice introduction. Uh, unfortunately, I'm I'm not in Brazil right now, but I asked the AI to generate a picture of Rio de Janeiro uh, in sunrise because it's sunrise for you, right? It's uh, morning. So this is Brazil, right? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I have been in Brazil before. I gave uh, the first ever workshop on network psychometrics uh, in Brazil. That is already almost 10 years ago. Um, but now Singapore is, is quite far away. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So in this hour, uh, I have until the end of the hour, right? Including questions? Yeah, about it. Okay, yeah. So until the end of the hour, I'll give a, a brief introduction to network psychometrics and to uh, what you can do with network models. Um, I'll show some interpretations of network models and um, I'll discuss some new things that are being developed, uh, future directions of the field and some things we can, uh, we can do now. First uh, about me. So um, I'm Sasha Epscom. I now work at the National University of uh, Singapore. Before that, I worked at the uh, University of Amsterdam, where I uh, was assistant professor. Um, and I also worked in the Center for Urban Mental Health, which is a center we have there for complexity and interdisciplinary research. And last year, I moved to Singapore to become associate professor there. Uh, I am also editor for several journals, and I developed a lot of software uh, for estimating ethical models for um, structural, um, psychometrics and uh, things like that. Um, so that, that's me. <clears throat> and the main thing I want to talk about today is uh, about network psychometrics and network modeling. Uh, and I was wondering if any of you already know about this or heard about this. Maybe you can raise your virtual hand if you heard about network psychometrics before or network analysis in psychology. Yeah, probably yes. People are kind of shy. Hmm. So some some of you heard about it before, so that's uh, that's nice. Uh, so this is uh, a new way of analyzing data that became uh, quite popular in the last ten years, and there's been a lot of developments also in the last ten years uh, on uh, how to do this and um, what you can do, and lots of software that's been developed. So I quickly want to briefly introduce the reasoning behind network psychometrics. Um, so <clears throat> mainly, um, well, I'm sure that you're all familiar with this model, right? Um, this is like the most basic psychometric model that there is. And, um, what we've been seeing, like these models, the latent variable models usually fit the data quite well. They've been used a lot, right? In the last hundred, 120 years of, uh, psychological science, uh, and usually uh, they fit really well, but the it might be hard sometimes to really find out then okay what well, the next step what is depression uh for example and uh, what this model does this model really tries to explain that these items are correlated with each other and tries to explain the correlations between these items uh usually this model also assumes that the observed items in this case the symptoms uh, sorry someone had a question or yeah so the, that uh, the symptoms here that they are uh, locally independent. That means that uh, latent variable explains the covariation between these symptoms. Um, but if you look at the observed variables, like this very simple latent variable model, and you can think of many similar observed variables in similar latent variables that have the same properties, you can uh, immediately think of all kinds of violations of these local dependencies. Like for example, if you uh, sleep badly, you might be tired. If you're tired, you might have concentrate. Uh, you might concentrate poorly. If you concentrate poorly, you might start worrying a lot about that. If you worry a lot, you might be up all night, be tired, uh, things like that. There's very reasonable direct effects that you can think of between these uh, these items that can already explain the correlational structure. And if you you have to violate local independence uh, independence already, then maybe you don't actually need a latent variable to explain the covariation of these items and to explain uh, the system, right? And maybe depression is is a bit more of a, a more complex system than just simply one thing that's in your brain that is causing covariation between these items. Maybe it's a bigger interplay of 
all kinds of things interacting with each other. Like for example, these symptoms interacting directly with each other, but beyond symptoms, of course, also biological factors, social factors, um, uh, social, um, yeah, societal factors, geographic factors. Like you can think of uh, a lot of things that are like playing a role in this system that, that might be then uh, what depression is. This line of reasoning, very briefly said, is what led to this uh, network perspective of psychology where uh, people reasoned, okay, maybe we can uh, actually think of, um, uh, look at observed behaviors at, at direct links between them. And maybe we can think of uh, systems uh, rather than latent variables and how do these systems work together. This was um, uh, published a lot uh, about 12 years ago, 15 years ago. And ever since, uh, many people have started to do, uh, try to do network modeling. And then the first problem that you encounter, okay, this is a nice story, right? But on the left, we have a model that we theoretically can assume and we can draw. On the right, I, I now just drew something, but typically we don't know this, this network structure and we don't know what kind of structure you would expect to find in these type of net networks of, for example, symptoms or attitudes or uh, personality uh, uh, personality aspects or cognitive domains, uh, things like that. So the first problem that we faced was, okay, how do we actually get a network structure that we can then use, for example, to study network properties of this system, right? So what, what might be an important node, for example, or what pathways are there, things like that. So this is something that I uh, work a lot on. Uh, and uh, I wrote a PhD on this topic, which is really about the topic of how do you go from, from data to a, a network model? Uh, so if you have a data set like the data that you use for uh, factor analysis, how do you use the data set like that to ex ex actually estimate a network model? And how do we use these in a statistical way, these models? And then uh, when we started doing that, it turns out that these type of models that are actually our statistical models that we can use to represent networks, and they are interpretable and they are estimatable and they're actually also uh, uh, nice and they're quite useful because they can tell us a lot about the data and they can allow us to explore the data in some new ways that we couldn't do before and really look at, okay, what relates to what, how do variables directly relate to each other rather than what's the shared covariance amongst the variables. It allows for new insight that is useful, even if you don't necessarily believe in this whole complexity story and this whole network perspective of psychology, you don't have to necessarily believe that the items are costly, uh, causing each other to use these network models, because you can also just use them as an exploratory data analysis tool to get some insight in, in your data. And that's what some people have been doing. And it turns out that you can even use the networks uh, as tools in psychometrics, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, later. So in my PhD, I uh, developed several P, uh, software packages and uh, several methods for estimating network models from data sets. And the main ones, they involve um, methods for estimating network from cross-sectional data. So you have, let's say, a spreadsheet. Every row is a person. Every column is a variable. Uh, just like you, the data that you would input in exploratory effect analysis, for example. And then there are uh, algorithms that you can use to estimate a network structure like this one. And here, the blue, like every node here, every circle represents a variable. Every line or edge represents a relationship between these variables. In this case, it's the strength of conditional association between all variables after controlling for everything else in the network. So it's a partial correlation between two variables after you condition on everything else in the network. And these partial correlation networks, they turned out to be really interpretable because they really allow you to look at what's unique, what's left after we control everything we know, what association is left between two items. And it turns out they're also very closely linked to causal models, which makes their interpretation very nice. And I'll, I'll show some examples later on. Uh, the blue edge means a positive effect, the red edge means a negative edge effect. And in this case, uh, in the picture on the top, the interest was in this PRS node, which is in the middle, which stands for polygenic risk score. And the interest here was to look at, okay, how does that link actually to symptoms of psychosis and uh, depression? Yeah. In the bottom, um, you see an example of a network that's estimated from longitudinal data, where we measure many people over time. 
Uh, and then we can uh, actually do more than just estimate one network structure. We can estimate a network that also tells us something about how do uh, people differ from each other um, and uh, something about temporal prediction over time, which is a very powerful thing that uh, allows you to say, okay, if I exercise, then three hours later, I am less energetic. Makes sense, but it's nice that the data shows that. The contemporaneous model here shows that if I exercise, I'm more energetic while I'm exercising. That also makes sense. So uh, that allows you yeah, for yeah, estimating more than just what you can do with the cross-sectional uh, data analysis. I'll show some, some math for those that are interested in it because it ultimately, yeah, these are nice pictures, but if you understand the math behind these pictures, then you really you understand everything there's to know about the, the networks. So uh, for the cross-sectional data, the type of model that we use uh, are called Paris marker van der Fields. And these are, it's a specific class of undirected network models where uh, every edge here indicates strength of conditional association. So how strong is the correlation between two variables after controlling everything else? And all the networks that are now usually published in literature fall under this class. Uh, if you have binary data, it's called an easing model. If you have continuous data, it's called a Gaussian graphical model. And there are also some other models like mixed graphical models that uh, you can use if you have mixed uh, types of data. Um, and these are quite useful, mainly because they're uniquely identified. So you can um, you can have some very powerful exploratory search algorithms that, that obtain one fitting network. If you want to try to estimate a network where A causes B, for example, we have arrowheads, then you can't do that because there are multiple possible networks that are equally uh, plus like A causes B is statistically not indistinguishable from B causes A if you have only observational data, for example. But A links to B is a unique model. There are no other models like that. Okay, this is what the mod looks like. Um, basically, what you can do is you can just take the coverage matrix, invert it, standardize it, and then you get the partial correlations, which is pretty cool that that's possible. And uh, this equation here, sigma equals delta I minus omega inverse delta. That's the way I write it. This delta is a diagonal matrix with variances, basically. I call them scaling parameters, but they're basically variances. And this omega is a square matrix that contains the partial correlations. Now, this is a model for the covariance structure, just like in factor analysis, you have a model for the covariance structure. So if you know how factor analysis works, then this is not different. If you don't know that, then you can uh, it, you can skip this. Of course, I'll, I'll show more pictures later on. Uh, for time series analysis, things get a little bit more complicated because you have to deal with uh, yeah a nested structure of of measurements in people. So you have a multi level structure that you need to deal with, and the math becomes uh, quite a lot more complicated. But uh, the model looks like this. Uh, which basically is a regression on the previous time point. So if this beta matrix, which is a regression on the previous time point uh, within person, and you add a between subject effect as well. Um, but the, if you, um, yeah, this model basically gives you the matrix that you can then use to uh, obtain uh, uh, SMA networks. I just wanted to include some of the math so that the people that are interested in that have some uh, something to, to look back for, but I don't have much more math than the rest of the slides. All right, so um, uh, this is already a few years ago uh, that I published my uh, dissertation and that uh, we work on this and that some other people also worked on developing software and methods that, uh, that you can use. And I feel like Back then, it was all new, and we we're trying to figure out what, what works, what doesn't work. But in the recent years, uh, the methods really became very crystallized already, and very like there's like a clear methodology of something that you can use, and that many people have used. And there are some clear recommendations, and we now know what what you can do and what you cannot do. And I'm very happy that uh, last year we actually published the first textbook on this, which uh, is uh, this book here which uh, I'm very happy about because it really contains a very nice overview of recommendations uh, and software and you can use and the methods that are used that are a bit more crystallized and uh, stable. Now, if you uh, don't uh, want to read that book, then they also have this book here, which I saw in uh, the closet of uh, Irene, I think, uh, in uh, the talk before me, which is uh, a Portuguese book on network psychometrics from uh, Brazil, which is really awesome. 
And as far as I know, that is actually the first book ever written on network psychometrics because it was written before we wrote our book, or at least uh, I think it was done before we wrote our book. So that's, uh, yeah, quite amazing. And also, yeah, shows, of course, that you have a very strong psychometric tradition in Brazil, uh, which yeah, it doesn't surprise me that, that there's a Portuguese book already. But I don't think there's a textbook in any other language than Portuguese and English right now. Uh, these are the main editors of the book. Uh, I'm one of them. Adela is the main uh, editor that uh, pulled everything together and actually made this whole thing possible. But there are many authors in the book. So in the book, we use a handbook style of writing where we have lots of authors that all contrib contributed to papers, uh, to chapters. So we have a yeah, consensus view on, on things in the book, which uh, yeah, I'm very happy about that uh, we managed to get all these people together to, to write this. Uh, and this is overview. So uh, the book actually discusses uh, lots of things. For example, uh, social network analysis, but mainly on in, uh, estimating undirected network models and uh, longitudinal network models. So I quickly wanted to show uh, some examples of that to show um, yeah what what you can do with these type of network models and what they look like. Uh, are there any questions so far? No. All right. Okay. So the main uh, method that many people have been using is uh, cross-sectional network analysis, where you just only have a data set where you have a row for each person and a column for each variable. And this is the type of analysis that has been worked out. Uh, it, that was the first we worked out. Just like in fact analysis, you, we first need to figure out the cross-sectional setting before we can even begin to move on to longitudinal settings uh, and things like that. Uh, this is now used quite a lot and there are some very stable methods for it. Uh, so there's like quite a lot of discussion in the book also about stability comparison, replicability of things. So uh, let's uh, go uh, to the Netherlands for an example. This is actually not the Netherlands, it's an AI uh, gener generated image that of the Netherlands, but it looks kind of like this. It's like has windmills and, and tulips. Yeah. And uh, in the Netherlands a few years ago, Adelis Verdano gave a course on network uh, analysis uh, during the COVID pandemic. And then she asked uh, the students to uh, gather data. So she asked the students to come up with some questions and then uh, gather data. So they all filled in the questionnaire themselves, but they asked their friends and their colleagues and their family, and they asked on the internet for people to fill it in. And they got uh, 500 responses. So 500, uh, 501 even, 501 responses, I think, uh, on quite a lot of variables. And this data set uh, is online on the Open Science Framework. So you can uh, play around with it, which is nice. Uh, for an example, in the book, we took a few of the variables and uh, used it to construct a network. So this is an example of a network that you might get if you uh, run a cross-sectional network analysis, uh, where we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight variables here. And we estimated what we call a Gaussian graphical model. And that's a network where all the links are partial correlation coefficients. So here, the variables are continuous and the links indicate the strength correlation after conditioning on everything else uh, in the network. And uh, I think this network shows quite a lot of nice things. So for example, you see a very strong link between worried sleep and sleep interference in the beginning. So people that have done not sleeping well, or sleep, no, sleep interference means that like sleep is interfering with my daily work. And worried sleep means I'm worried about uh, sleep uh, being bad for me. It makes sense that those things are very strongly linked to each other. Might be that they cause each other, but it might also simply be some topological overlap. And that they kind of measure the same thing because your sleep is interfering with things. So then you worry about things if it's interfering with things. Right? Uh, one thing that's interesting to see here is that actually having regular sleep uh, patterns is not as strongly associated with these two uh, items in the bottom as you would expect. That might be simply because this word sleep and sleep interference are so strongly linked, they're so strongly predicting each other already that they don't need to link to regular sleep to explain the coverage pattern. Uh, and there's some other patterns in here as well that, that might be interesting. So one way in which you can use this network is simply to get an exploratory insight in what's happening in this data. And because it's yeah, it's exploratory. We have no theory going in here. Uh, you can't really use it to confirm anything unless you had like a, a prior belief, but you can use it as a hypothesis generating tool to think, okay, 
how can these variables be linked to each other and um, yeah, to generate hypothesis and to ideas, which you could, of course, in principle, uh, test in like new data sets, for example, or new experiments, right? So uh, one thing um, that you can see in the network, for example, is uh, maybe uh, there are, these links are caused by causal pathways. For example, if feeling alone leads to you being less happy, and if you're more happy, you're more optimistic about the future. And that seems like a very plausible causal pathway to me, and that's in line with this network structure. And it turns out that this network structure, actually, if you draw a causal model, so you can also do a causal model with, with arrows, like in you do in structural equation modeling, then wherever there is a an arrow in the causal model, there's also an arrow, an edge or link in this model, in the network model. And if there's no arrow in the causal model, there is no link in the network model unless there is a common effect. And I'll show that in a bit. But it means that uh, mostly if a causal model does underlie the data and if these things do cause each other, the links are, uh, you would expect cause effect where the links are in the network, which allows you for, to get some exploratory insight in, in what might be happening. So this might be the case. Because we can't confirm it, it's observational data, but it seems like a very plausible pathway to me. Here we see another one, which I found really interesting, that perhaps uh, feeling alone causes very happy, like we said before. So if you feel very alone, you uh, feel less happy. If you're not alone, you feel more happy. And maybe feeling happy about your health causes you to be very happy. Makes perfect sense to me. The reason I put this in here is because if you look at the link between feeling alone and being happy about your health, it's positive which is bizarre because it shouldn't be positive, right? That makes no sense that you would um, uh, feel happier about your health if you're alone, if you feel alone or if you're lonely. You would expect more that these things are not really related to each other. Um, and the, the thing here that, that is important to note is that this relationship, this link here is a conditional association. So it's a partial correlation coefficient. So that means that it's the partial correlation between happy health and feeling alone after conditioning and controlling for everything else in the network. Now, if you happen to have two variables that are causing a third one and you condition on the third one, then that can induce a correlation between the two variables. For example, if you, um, let's say if you have students and students are either very motivated or they're not motivated and they take high, uh, very hard classes or they take easy classes, and let's say there's no correlation between how motivated the students are and how easy the class is that they take. But if we then look at their grades and we look at um, students that had uh, an A+, so a very good grade, and we see that the student was not motivated at all, then we can suddenly say that, okay, the student was not motivated, that student must have taken a very easy class. Right? Or if you see that the student had a, an, a D and the student was... Uh, in a uh, super easy class, then that student must have been not motivated at all, right? Because uh, otherwise uh, would not have gotten the D. Um, like guys, if you have a, yeah, a very easy class um, and um, you, you have a very non-motivated student, yeah, then you have like, you get, um, now, if you know the grade, you can expect some correlations to emerge between these uh, items. That's what I mean. Yeah. Uh, so that might also be the case here. So a uh, positive association emerged because of controlling on very happy. And actually, the correlation between these items, if you don't control anything, is, is negative or this is non-existing. I think it's slightly negative and not significant. So that's uh, pretty powerful that we can see in this network that something is happening there and it can only be explained really by this common effect structure where both of these are causing very happy. So this seems like a very plausible causal pathway uh, to me. It could also be that you just have mutual causation. Like for example, happy love life and feeling alone might just both cause each other. Something that we cannot ever fit if we try to fit uh, directed pathways in structural equation modeling, for example, but we can model with an undirected edge here. Um, of course, you can also have latent variables causing uh, co-variation. So in this case, there's a positive effect between sleeping regularly and uh, feeling lonely. That didn't make much sense to me, but then I thought, okay, but these are our students. 
right? So maybe the students that have a very active social life are less lonely and they sleep poor. Could be, not sure, right? But might uh, might be possible. So those are just some uh, some things to show about how you can use a network to to get some insight in what me, might be relating to what and um, yeah possible causal pathways. But you can also simply use it to look, for example, for where might latent variables be or what predicts what. You don't have to take a a cause interpretation. Now uh, a lot of work has been done on uh, on sexual networks, and we now know a lot about what we can do with them and what we can't do with them. And one main thing that uh, is a very important topic of uh, debate is, okay, if you have a network like that, uh, how do you know if it's stable or accurate or interpretable? Uh, and it turns out that choices that you make, for example, in estimation, the routine that you use, but also in the sample size that you use, do have an impact on, on what you get. So here I have an example of simulated data where I simulate the data under the same network. So it should lead to the same network if you estimate it, if you have infinite sample size. And then every column here is a different way of estimating the network. Every row is a different sample size. So a very low sample size in the top and it's 300, very high sample size at the bottom and it's 5,000. And you see at the top, there are quite some differences already in what estimator you use. So that, um, yeah. That makes a lot of difference. So it's important to know that, yeah, if you use a different estimator on low sample size, you might get a different result, right? Um, and you have to be careful in what estimator you choose here. And I can go into the detail here in this talk, but um, yeah, if you're more in interested in that, then I can recommend the paper and uh, it's also discussed in the book. But there's a lot of work on, on this now. Um, okay, what estimator is good? When do you use, for example, regularization, which is a way of estimating a network model where you pull certain edges towards zero and get a more cleaner picture. Or when do you use something like uh, the GGM mod select, which is an algorithm that's very conservative and really tests every edge if it's there or not and includes it or not. So it's more conservative, but then you can trust better that the edges that are there are not false positives. And there's a lot of debate on that and uh, what the estimator to use. Another thing that's really important to know with these networks is that they are estimates, right? They're exploratory estimates from, from data, which means just like any other estimate, any other parameter that we estimate in uh, any other psychometric setting, they are subject to sampling variation. Right? So that means that in a second data set, we might get different results. And so here I simulated uh, 12 data sets, all from the same true model. I estimated 12 times the network. And... Um, and then I, uh, I I showed results here. And what you see is that um, all these 12 networks, they're kind of similar, right? But they are different. Like you see some lines are stronger in one network compared to the other one. Some lines are there in one network. Some lines are not there in another one. But there are some small differences in there. And that's, that's natural because, yeah, th that's just sampling variation, right? We don't have an infinite sample size. We have uh, noise around the data, just like estimating two means from two groups. And then you need to compare if those groups are different or not, right? You can't just look at the means because there are different because there are two different groups. So you need to do statistical testing, statistical inference, uh, things like that. That's also really important to know for the networks that the lower the sample size, the more it's going to change, the more different it's going to be because you simply have less power to pick up edges and you might get like uh, more different results here. Now that has been uh, one of the main topics where a lot of publications focus on, investigating the stability and accuracy of these networks. So, okay, we know this, that there's sampling variation, but then what do you do if you only, you only get one network, if you have only one sample, right? So you get uh, this network, for example. Okay, is it stable or not? And there's lots of uh, work on that. Uh, the main method that we use is bootstrapping to um, get insight in the sampling variation around uh, the estimates. But there are also Bayesian methods and analytic conference intervals and, and other work on that to really look at, okay, how stable are the edges? Are they interpretable or not? Uh, there's a lot of work on group comparison. So just seeing two networks and they are different doesn't mean that the underlying network structure is different. So you need to do statistical testing for that. There's lots of work on that. So there are bootstrapping routines as well, uh, permutation tests uh, that uh, reshuffle the data. That's a very common method to use. But there's also multi-group methods, comparison methods, Bayesian methods. There's uh, several ways you can do this. 
another topic of debate is uh, one thing that many people do if they estimate a network structure is they look at the centrality of nodes and look at, okay, what are the most important, most influential nodes? And there are some metrics you can use for that called centrality metrics, but they're derived from uh, graph theory, from social network analysis, which means that they look, for example, at a real world network and they say, okay, um, let's say Berlin is in between Amsterdam and Prague. So Berlin connects Amsterdam and Prague. That makes sense in a real world network might make less sense if these are partial correlations. And it also turns out that they're not always stable. So you also need to do some bootstrapping methods, at least to look at if the results from your centrality analysis are actually interpretable or are just noise. Finally, there's a lot of the discussion on, on replicability. Um, a lot of papers have been written about that. Mainly if you have a low sample size and your bootstrap indicates you have very high variability in your edges, then you're going to expect to get a slightly different network back the next time you, you run it on a new sample size, which uh, is very important to know. And there's also uh, some work indicating cost of study heterogeneity, which means that simply the studies also differ. If you have a sample from PTSD symptoms, for example, in America, that might be very different than a sample of PTSD symptoms uh, in uh, in China, for example, uh, after experiencing a different trauma, right? Like an earthquake, you cannot really compare maybe to a flooding or maybe you can, but there might be some more heterogeneity there. Maybe this might also impact uh, replicability. Uh, there is quite a lot of papers on replicability of networks of varying degrees of quality that uh, discuss this uh, this issue um, and there's a lot of work on that and again like the best way to solve it are a lot of like nice statistical methods that you can use to see okay are your results stable are the groups different from each other or not things like that so those are really the hot topics of debate in in this field and then um, we can move on from cross-sectional network analysis to longitudinal network analysis where we don't have one sample, but we have several samples of people. Like for example, we measure people three times or four times, or maybe even a hundred times. And it's really powerful because it allows us to separate what's happening between people and what's happening within people. And it also allows us to get a network that uh, allows us to see something over time. Uh, and this is also a big topic in, uh, in the literature. How do you estimate network models from, from time series data? So here I estimated the network model from a data set where we have many people meshed over time. And then you can separate uh, effects within time point to effects between time points and effects within person to effects between person. So for example, here the temporal network says, if I, am more, uh, if I feel more hopeless than my efforts at a certain time point, I expect that I worry more at the next time point, three hours later, for example. And the between subject network says, if I am a person that is very hopeless on, on average, then I might be a person that worries a lot on average. We again see a unexpected red edge in the between subject network here, or an edge to a different sign. Hopeless or difficult relax might again be a collider effect on, on worry. They might both cause worry there, which uh, might be interesting. Another thing that many people do is, okay, this is based on data of many people measured over time. But you could also uh, just use data of only one person measured many times. And then you can get a personal network. You cannot get a between subject network because you don't have multiple subjects, it's just one subject. But you can get a temporal network and a contemporaneous network of one person over time. You get a personalized network structure and you can use that to gain insight in what's happening in this one person. So maybe if, if I give enough responses, I can estimate those two networks on the left for just me. And then it tells me something about, okay, uh, what does my structure look like, right? What happens if, if I worry? Not what happens if the average person worry, but what happens, happens if, if I worry? What happens if I uh, feel hopeless, for example? And that might be very useful for clinical practice. So many people have been suggesting that uh, those networks are used in clinical practice. We give a patient an ESM app, uh, like an app on the phone that beeps sometimes, and then you fill in questionnaires. And then you use that uh, after a while to construct a network. And then you use that network in clinical practice to, um, uh, to discuss what's happening in that patient. And it's a very promising line of, of research. And many people um, really want to do that. And some people have done it already. And uh, they got some nice results, some nice feedback from the patients as well. 
Uh, there's one thing that is very important though, uh, if you do that, and that is that the uh, road from uh, cross-sectional network to longitudinal network analysis, yeah, it is quite, uh, it's, it's not an easy road. It, it does become harder. So uh, basically, if you take this model, let's, let's ignore the between subject effects and only look at the left two. It's uh, it, there are more networks, right, than just uh, a network on section data where we only have, have one set of nodes, right? Because you have to add these these temporal effects, and that uh, makes things more complicated. So we have actually a more complicated model. If we have uh, ten variables, ten nodes, then if you have a cross-sectional network, we have fifty-five parameters. But if you have a temporal network or a, a time series network of one person, we have 155 parameters, which is 100 more parameters that we need to estimate. We have to make some problematic assumptions, like the person doesn't change over time and all the measurements are equally distant from each other, which usually doesn't happen because the phone beeps, but then you might pick it up half an hour later to fill in your questionnaire. And um, the sample size of a NS1 time series analysis, so where all the rows are time points and all the columns are variables and you have one person, is effectively lower than what you have in cross-sectional uh, data analysis, simply because there is a correlation between observations. Right? So take an extreme case where the autocorrelation is one. So that means that if I score five on the question, do I worry a lot? Then I score five again the next time and five again, again uh, the time afterwards and five again the time afterwards. You can ask me the same question a hundred times and I fill in the same answer a hundred times. If that happens, then I only have one response, not a hundred, right? So you only have one response uh, to base a model on and, and not a hundred because it's just a hundred times the same response. And basically only if the correlation is zero, you get actually a hundred responses. If the other correlation like 0.5, it is somewhere effectively between zero, uh, one and a hundred response that you, that you get. So you get effectively a lower sample size. The point that I'm trying to make here is that if you collect data from one person over time and you collect maybe 50 to 100 time points, which might be very hard to do already in clinical practice, then you only have a data set of NS50 or NS100 to estimate a model that is more complicated than what we estimate in cross-sectional network analysis. And here I said uh, the top row is a small sample, uh, a small sample size of 300. And here I showed an example of NS500, which is a decent sample size for network analysis. Maybe using a sample size of NS100 or NS50 for a temporal uh, time search network in clinical practice might be too ambitious. Uh, so that is uh, not a nice message, but uh, as something that's important to know that maybe doing really personalized network at the NS1 level might be, be taking things a step too far. But we can do things as long as we keep it simple, as, keep, as long as we keep the number of nodes small, like I did here, only a few, not like 10 or 20. So that's uh, discussed in this paper where we looked at the feasibility of actually using uh, ideographic NS1 network analysis, uh, which uh, it can be done, but it, it, it's hard. Yeah. Okay. Um... Then the last thing I quickly wanted to talk about is psychometrics, if I have time still. Yeah. Okay. So, so far I talked about estimating network models, but um, yeah, uh, this, uh, the network analysis or network psychometrics is actually really closely related to psychometrics as, as we know it, like the latent variable modeling effect analysis. There's a lot of ways in which um, network analysis and factor modeling or general um, psychometric modeling are related to each other. Uh, one way, for example, is that these models are actually equivalent. So a factor model where factors cause covariation on the data is actually the same as a network model where you have clusters in the model. And that's pretty good to know because that means that if you look at a picture, like uh, for example, uh, these, you see some clusters in there, those could also be latent variables. So that means that if you estimate a network model, it doesn't necessarily mean that the latent variable model is not true. It might mean that it actually is true. And if you see this clustering in the data, then it's very strong evidence that maybe, okay, maybe those actually are latent variables that we're interested in looking, looking at. Uh, there's a really nice uh, line of research from uh, Hudson Golino in the University of Virginia that um, <clears throat> Uh, uses this fact to uh, look for dimensionality in the uh, data set. 
So what he does is he um, estimates a network model, does community detection, and then uses those community as um, hypothesis generating uh, IDs on what are the latent variables and where are the latent variables, how many factors underlie the data and what are the indicators. Which is uh, nice because we started network psychometrics as a alternative latent variable modeling, but now it turns out that we can actually use it as a tool to do latent variable modeling, which is uh, really nice. It also means that if you estimate a network model from data and you get a nice looking picture, it doesn't necessarily mean that the network model was a true generating structure. It could have been a latent variable model. But depending on the estimator you use here, for example, here I simulated data under latent variable model. And on the right, I estimated networks with different estimators. They look quite different, but they all actually are the same model. But if you look at the panel C here, you might not say, okay, that really is latent variable model, but it's simply because it doesn't try to estimate something that looks like latent variable model. And that's Im important to know that just seeing a picture alone doesn't mean latent variable model is, is not true. Now, finally, in the end, if you look at these things, like on the left here, I have the factor analysis. On the right here, I have the network model as I define it. They are not that different, right? So here I have sigma equals lambda psi lambda transpose plus theta. So that's the factor loading matrix times the factor variance covariance matrix times the plus the times the factor loading matrix transpose plus the residual variances. And on the right, I have sigma equals a bunch of other Greek letters, right? It's the same thing. It just different Greek letters in a different way written, but uh, it's not, not different. So that means that we can actually combine these frameworks and use strength of one framework in the other framework because they are actually, in principle, the same thing. There are lots of stuff we can do in structural case modeling and fact analysis that's very useful. Things like fit analysis, multi-group analysis, uh, full information maximum likelihood estimation, modification, just things like that. There are lots of things we can use in uh, doing network analysis that are very useful like exploratory search, which you can't really do in structural equation modeling, not, not that powerful, uh, but you don't have latent variables, but in the end, they're not that different, so we can combine them. So that's what I did in uh, what, what I like to call the, the future of network psychometrics, which is this R package I'm working on called psychometrics, which word usually autocorrects to psychometrics, but, but I write it psychometrics. And that is an R package that really is aimed to combine structural equation modeling and network analysis. So it, it, it allows you to do structural equation modeling. You can actually do CFA in there and SEM. It's just that Lafan is better. So I would use that because it's a bit faster. And I, all I try to do is just try to replicate Lafan, which, which it does. But then you can choose to also incorporate network models in the latent variable structure or in the observed data structure. So you can get things like combinations of the two where you have a network at the latent level or a network at the residual uh, level. And you can get uh, other things like multi-group analysis, multi-group comparison, uh, measurement variance testing, homogeneity testing, full information, maximum likelihood estimation, um, things like that. So uh, this is something that I'm working on now, which allows you to really do psychometrics, but then with networks. And I think, uh, yeah, you can also do it for longitudinal data analysis. So this is for panel data where we have uh, multiple waves of data and we can estimate these temporal structures and the contemporaneous structures uh, as well at the latent level. So the, the nodes here are latent variables above the factor model and it's all combined in the same framework just like a dynamic factor model but then with, with networks. I think that's uh, all I mentioned. Uh, I'll, I'll skip this. And um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to talk about. Just to give you an introduction on uh, what is network psychometrics, what are the net these network models, uh, and some of the more recent trends like personalized network modeling, uh, the tools for investigating stability, accuracy, replicability, and combining latent variable models with uh, network models. All right. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, then uh, please let me know if there's time still. Whoa, amazing. I I'm really impressed. So, uh, First, uh, I need to say one thing. Do you remember the book that you show from Brazil? This one? Yeah, this one. Actually, this book was published by us here in our oh, really? university. Yes. Oh, there's that's a, nice. Yeah, that's a very good to know because uh, 
we are very far away right now. I'm in Brazil, you are in Singapore, but mm -hmm. we are really close <laughs> when you show our book. So that's amazing. I, I would like to read it, but but it's in Portuguese. But the yeah. foreword is in English. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you, you you made the introduction for us. I remember yeah, yeah. Sandra you. So it was a nice collaboration. So I have a question, Sasha, for you. Actually, I had three questions, but two of them you answered during your presentation. But I still have one question that triggered me out in this one. In some public, in some past publications, we found the same structure using network analysis and factor analysis. So you told that already. However, we had a lot of questions between uh, we have we had a lot of questions because when you deal the data using network analysis and factor analysis, we can reach the same the same conclusion, but the methodological is very different. It's not very different, as you said, but we have philosophical difference between network analysis and factor analysis. So can you please describe a little bit more about when we have the same the same con statistical conclusion using data analysis? In psychometric, in traditional psychometrics, or using network analysis, and what we can do when we have situations like that. So um, they are comparable and they can be equivalent to each other, the latent variable and the network model. But the focus point is very different. And in the network model, we really look at the unique relationships between items, where in the latent variable model, we look at the shared relationships between multiple sets of items, like the shared covariance among items. Um, when they are equivalent, you see this very clear uh, clustering structure in the network. And if you see that, then um, that gives you really strong evidence that that your factor model is behaving in the way that you expect it to behave. That's actually one thing that I, when I teach structural equation modeling, I advise students to just make a network because um, what I do is I let students gather a data set. And then they have a theoretical factor model in mind. And then usually it doesn't fit because like, it's not like an, they ex, an actual skill that they use. They just come up with items. And then if you look at an epic model, you can see, okay, but uh, here these items are not clustering in the way that you expect. This item is actually clustering with the other group, which might be a very useful insight that it's just very hard to, to see when you do factor analysis. You might miss that, right? Yeah. You might miss that. Okay. Got it, but on the top of my head, now I know how to clarify my question. When you use factor analysis, we, we just publish a paper and say, we have a latent variable here called depression, and depression is responsible for something here. So we have a latent instructor here, and you have manifest variables there. And here, here we go. However, when you publish, you use the network methods. I don't know if you, we are allowed to say, we have a cluster, and cluster is the same thing that factor uh, latent variable, and they're the same thing because theoretical they are different. So I think my question is that what we can do, because we know from the statistical framework they are very equivalent. However, from the psychological perspective, they might be different. Well, that, that's the point, is that they are statistically very closely related and equivalent, but of course, theoretically, completely different. Yeah. And so that is, uh, yeah. That's the question. That, that is the hard part. So that's actually the reasoning behind doing network analysis started from a paper from 2006, where Hans van der Maas showed that if you simulate data under a network model, then we used a mutualism model. Uh, a mutualism model where things mutually are beneficial for each other, you get data that perfectly fits the latent variable model. And that simply means that, okay, so we can get a data set that perfectly fits the latent variable model, uh, but it is not generated by a latent variable model, it's generated by something else. All right, so that, so that means that just fitting a latent variable model does not necessarily mean that a latent variable model generated the data. And the other way around, right? Just fitting a network model does not necessarily mean that a network model simulated the data or generated the data. But that, that's the hard part. I mean, if you really want to establish that something is a latent variable or not, yeah, you you can't really do that statistically. I mean, you, you can compare a sparse network to a latent variable structure because they imply different hypotheses on the covariance structure. For example, the covariance matrix is, is lower in rank 
then it is if the network can analyze the data if it's sparse. But the network could also have been not sparse. And then, yeah, there's no way to distinguish between that with observational data. The only thing you can do is, yeah, experimental data or trying to find latent variable. Or, for example, the latent variable model for depression, if you really believe in a very strong latent variable model where there's no local independence, which um, is not necessarily in line with theory of depression, right? Depression is just like there is something called depression that causes the symptoms. But if you really strongly believe in the local independence uh, assumption, then intervening on one symptom should not impact other symptoms. So that's something you, you could test. You could do an experiment with that, right? Uh, and if that's not the case, then if you intervene on one symptom and you do get like other symptoms activating, then that's more in line with the network perspective. Amazing. I think that's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> it is hard, yeah. So any questions? One question here that was private to me, uh, João is asking if you're going to share your slide, your presentation. Uh, I can do that, sure. Okay, amazing. So any question? So we have another question. Uh, Rodrigo Leon, if possible, could you talk a bit about comparing depression outcome results between clinical and non-clinical samples, particularly uh, if there's the same dimension structurally with different data collection in, in chat? Uh, different data collection methods, but the same estimation algorithm for the community detection. Actually, Rodrigo is my PhD student, and we are working <laughs> using network analysis. Uh, There's the one interesting uh, problem with uh, clinical data sets, if, if you mean like people that meet the clinical thresholds for, for example, depression or so, uh -huh. is that the definition of the diagnosis usually uh, relies on the symptoms. So for example, you, you diagnose on depression because you have five out of nine depressive symptoms, one of them being depressed mood, right? Um, so if you have a data set where only people are included that have that uh, meet the threshold, then uh, what's happening is that you are selecting people based on the threshold, which is a function of the variables that are you, you, you are using in the network analysis. You get the same effect as I talked about earlier with the common effect structure, where you condition on something that is a function of uh, the stuff that you want to look at. So you uh, induce all kinds of relationships then between the items of interest, which is uh, called selection bias of Bergson bias. And that's a really big problem. That's, for example, if you have a top tier university and you only allow people in that are either like really good academically or really good athletically on a sports fellowship, then in the university, there's going to be a negative correlation between academic skill and athletic skill. Because if you have someone that has uh, super high academic skills, the person did not need a sports fellowship to get in. So probably it's not like Olympic athlete level um, athlete. You get the same thing here. So what you get is you get negative edges between the symptoms simply because of the selection procedure. And that's a really big problem now that we have a solution for that we're proposing, but it's still a work in progress. That's a, a big challenge with, with, with clinical samples. So many times, if you have a sample, you can't just select the patients or the, the people that meet the clinical threshold based on the symptoms. Of course, you can use people from clinical practice or people that are patients already, and then compare them to uh, non-clinical samples using um, yeah comparison methods, but you have to be careful that you don't uh, select or select the people in a clinical sample based on the the symptoms themselves. And that might be hard because that's just how you define it. Right? That 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 is that is quite a problem. And as you, for example, compare like a group based on risk factors to a group based on no risk factors, like earthquake survivors between compared to people that live in a similar village that don't survive an earthquake or like don't have an earthquake, like for example. But yeah, that, that is quite a hard part, yeah, a problem. Does that answer your question? I'm not sure. Rodrigo? Probably he's thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, yes, you answered me. All right. Thank I'm you. thinking, you know, about. So, Sasha, our time is over. Again, it was a very 
pleasure to have you here with us. I know in Singapore is, I don't know, quite night right now. Uh, yeah, at nine o'clock, it's okay. <laughs> nine o'clock, okay. Time for a beer. <laughs> 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 okay, all doors are open to you. I hope to see you again in next and new opportunities. And Sasha, if you want to stay with us, you are very welcome. But now we're going to move forward. Thank you again. Right. And again, it was a huge Thank pleasure. you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay. And please come to Brazil sometimes to have a beer and talk about psychometric and network analysis with Golino, Woodson Golino, when I was doing I, I, I would love to, but it is a pretty long flight from uh, Singapore. <laughs> yeah, 18 hours. I hope to visit Brazil Singapore. again. Yeah. Okay. Amazing. Bye bye, Sasha. Thank you. Bye bye. See ya. Bom, que, que palestra, né? Pelo menos eu gostei bastante. Eu acho que eu fui o que mais me beneficiou dessa, dessa apresentação. É, tava pensando agora, Valkyria, você continua aí ou é o Matheus que está coordenando agora? Oi, eu vou ficar até às 11, mas o Matheus está aqui junto de mim. Beleza. Aí, Val, acho que uma estratégia para a gente conseguir depois separar direitinho os vídeos e colocar no canal do, do IBNEC é a gente parar de gravar e recomeçar a gravação. O que, que você acha? Tá, a gente pode fazer, pode ser. E talvez, é, talvez assim fique um pouco mais fácil, né? Na hora de depois a gente divulgar esse conhecimento. Pode ser? Tá bom, eu vou parar aqui então.